of us use it every day. Some of us have never ridden a train, but regardless, the railway is enormously important in the development of our cities, in our industrial supply chains, and in the pursuit of future sustainable city-to-city -city transport. My name is Dr. Stephen Herod, and I would like to welcome you to our course, Railway Operations and Management, at the Technical University of Denmark. The Railway Operations and Management course consists of approximately five subject areas. We examine the technology of railways, we examine the economics of railways, and then we go into more sophisticated management science applications of mathematical programming and operations planning. At one time in the past, the railway was a general application for all transport needs. Passenger and freight were mixed together. Railways were designed to be everything to everybody all the time at every little local town and station everywhere in the country. This is no longer true and in today's presentation I'm going to give you a short introduction to the history of railways and then discuss how the modern railway has adapted to be more specialized and more efficient in its delivery of transport services. Historically 150 years ago Railways were feeders to the port cities. They were to connect the inland lands to the ports, and they were not really looked upon as long-distance travel routes from city to city inland. As that attitude changed, as the technology of railways improved, we had a railway fever, and many railways were constructed in areas where they maybe were not economically viable. This led to a collapse of the railways at the turn of the 19th century and this further led to many countries nationalizing their railways, making them government entities like the Postal Service or the Water Works. And for a while this worked and provided inexpensive transportation to most of the people of the country. But eventually the railways became uh, uh, stuck in their ways, old-fashioned, and suffered competition with deregulated road transport. In the 1980s, in the last 30 or 40 years, we've seen a deregulation of railways and a modern revival. As a result of the decline of the railways after World War II and the deregulation and the government policy changes, there was an enormous reduction in railway mileage, railway kilometers of track, both in North America and in Europe. And you can see that here in these comparative maps of the state of Wisconsin in North America and in this map of the United Kingdom showing the effects of what was called the beaching cuts of 1965, which was a major reduction in kilometers in mileage of railway track in the United Kingdom. An enormous revolution in railway transportation can really be attributed to various moves to deregulate and stimulate innovation in the railway industry since 1980. This in the United States is the Staggers Railway Act, which freed the railways to be more innovative in their contracting, to set their own pricing, and freedom to, to choose what services they were going to provide. And in the United Kingdom, the privatization of the railway infrastructure the conversion of the railway network to what is called an open access network and then in the EU later in 2001 similar directives to free up the network and provide opportunity for private operators to compete and be innovative in the development of new services. This led to enormous growth in rail traffic in the United States as you can see here and a similar enormous growth in the United Kingdom in railway traffic uh, mode share. We have a growth in the, in the passenger mode share in the United Kingdom and a absolute growth in the total passengers carried in the United Kingdom. You'll notice that the title of this course is Railway Operations and Management and that's really important to realize that a modern railway is a business and so much of this course we will focus on things such as what are the finances? How do I use this tool or technology to improve the performance of this railway as a business? How does this technology, how does this plan support the customer 
and build the business, build the customer patronage of this railway. The, day, uh, the current DSB network, for example, is a large business. It has 12, over 12 billion kroner of revenue, and it is approximately one-third the size of Scandinavian Airlines, and in 2014 at least, it was actually actually a little bit more profitable than Scandinavian Airlines. So this is a really large business. This is a big business. In this course, we will spend the mo majority of our time studying passenger rail services because that forms the bulk of the railway activity in Denmark and the majority of the uh, employment opportunities for you as a graduating student. Uh, however, we will spend a little time on freight as well later in the course. But passenger rail can really be divided into three three categories of service. There is the urban service, like our S-Bane, like our commuter rail services. Then there is regional services, uh, like our service between Copenhagen and Roskilde, or uh, Copenhagen and Unsa, and these, uh, or Copenhagen and Helsinger. These are uh, more uh, regional services. And then there's high-speed services, which currently we do not have in Denmark, but which uh, would be characterized by uh, the high-speed railways in, in Germany, the TGV, the ICE, um, the, the AVE trains in Spain, these, these high-speed trains which are typically reserved for services greater than 250 kilometers per hour. That really typically is the technical definition of high-speed rail service faster than 250 kilometers per hour. You can see how each of these services has its own market position, its own competitive niche. Uh, urban rail competing typically with the personal automobile, with buses. Uh, uh, sometimes in, in Denmark it's competing with the bicycle. Uh, and examples of this are the Metro and uh, the S-Bane and the Locale Bane and soon the light rail is coming as well. And then regional rail is again competing with the personal automobile, uh, competing with the bus, uh, and examples of this are the Orsento, the train to Hamburg, uh, trains to Ulensa, to Aarhus. These are more regional railway trains, uh, but they do not qualify as high speed. None of them qualify as high speed because none of them exceeds, uh, currently, none of them exceeds uh, 180 kilometers an hour. So the uh, uh, then the true high speed would compete with airlines and possibly compete with the automobile, although only possibly uh, the only competition between the automobile and high speed is maybe the car is cheaper. It's certainly not going to compete on speed and then uh, possibly again the same kind of competition with uh, long haul bus and uh, examples of this again are the TGV and the German ICE. We're here at Rungstel Kust on the Kust Bane for DSB and Bane of Denmark. And here we can see the fundamental components of a railway system. When most people think of railways, they first think about the rolling stock. And here we see the train, the electric train rolling by as it departs Rungstel Kust. But there's more to a railway than just the rolling stock. There's also the signals and the track. Signals, track, and rolling stock. These are the fundamental components that make a railway transport service. So here we are with a typical locomotive of the classic railway age. Built in 1917, a Swedish steam locomotive for mixed service, for passenger service, for freight service. But look how big and heavy it is. Look how heavy the parts are. Look how massive it is. This is what railway management of 100 years ago was all about. And truthfully, 100 years ago, railway management was just about getting the train to run at all. And we've moved past this today. 
We no longer spend as much time and effort maintaining the trains. We no longer have trains that have to spend 12 hours a day in the workshop being serviced and repaired. We have trains that are much closer to running uh, a full workday, uh, a full 18 hour workday without any significant service. And so now our management of railways has moved on. Now we're more interested in how efficiently can we manage the railways? How efficiently can we provide service for people? And much less of our time and energy is devoted to just purely making it go. So railway technology has come a long way in the last hundred years. This wagon behind me was made in 1885, and yet it was still in service up until World War II. It is a boxcar designed to carry beer. It's a refrigerated boxcar. And it has four wheels, but it has no brakes. It has no brake rigging, and it has a very simple, basic coupling system, buffers and chain. And this kind of car is the typical technology of the railways of 100 years ago. And yet today, it is still compatible with many of the wagons in service on railways today. So this demonstrates how long technology holds, how hard it is to transition technology on the railways, because so many pieces of it have to be standardized, have to be kept in, in compatible mode with the existing equipment from the old days. Copenhagen Central Station. The classic inner city, long distance passenger station. But things aren't the same as they used to be. Cut into the stone wall of Copenhagen Central Station, it says first and second class waiting room. But there isn't a waiting room any longer. Who needs to wait? We have schedules, we have planners, we have tightly synchronized trains. Nobody comes to the passenger station to wait anymore. Here in Copenhagen Central Station, we have a live map showing all of the S-Bain trains as they make their way across the network. All of this data-driven information to keep passengers aware of where they're going and when they're going to get there. So here we are now at Dubelsbro, south of Copenhagen. Behind me, 20 years ago, was a major railway freight shunting yard for Copenhagen. 20 years ago, before the Ursen Bridge, trains had to stop here. They were disconnected, they were shunted, they were broken into smaller pieces, and they were put on ferries to go across to Sweden. Those ferries no longer exist. Trains no longer stop on their way through Copenhagen. So this freight yard no longer has a purpose. And so now we see it is being converted into hotel, commercial, and residential property. It's a demonstration of how the change in the infrastructure and the change in technology makes the railways more efficient, reduces waste, and conversely also reduces the amount of railway infrastructure and makes the railways look less visible to the public. And this is a challenge in discussing the importance of railways. The more efficient they become, the more valuable they are, the less visible to the public they are. This is Dr. Stephen Herod, and I want to thank you for joining me, and I look forward to talking to you about railways again.